Hey YouTube, in this video we're going to be doing kind of an overview on ASRock's X670E motherboards. I'm not going to cover MATX form factor or micro ATX or even IATX um, because the primary focus of this video is going to be looking at selecting a motherboard for a standard size build. So this is typically going to be an ATX form factor, usually a mid tower case, but it could be a full tower case. Um, there are a few small cases that can fit a full ATX motherboard, but we're also going to be looking at one uh, EATX motherboard, and that one's going to be the Tai Chi. So we're going to look at that a little bit later, but basically what I'm looking at here is selecting a motherboard based off of the purpose of e making an all-rounder type PC, so one that can excel at not just typical gaming, because I know a lot of people out there, it's probably the largest audience for this sort of info, but also those that are looking at building kind of a prosumer type workstation. So obviously a workstation would be something more like Federer Pro Pro, um, but if you're on a budget and if you're not really doing anything for like real uh, professional like corporate type work, I mean this is kind of good as like an independent contractor sort of build um, or just something that you want to put together in your spare time as a hobby and you might want to dabble in things like, you know, Blender or uh, any kind of DaVinci Resolve or editor software, if you're going to do kind of programming, that sort of thing. Like I think this is a, like a really good uh, use case for these sort of uh, platforms from AMD. So uh, we're going to look at the ASRock motherboards today because uh, I will be going over the other AIB vendors. So, you know, ASUS, Gigabyte, MSI um, at a later video uh, for each of those respectively. Uh, but we're going to be looking at ASRock today. We're just going to kind of start from the top and then work our way down. So uh, we're going to look at the, we're going to go up the stacks. So we're going to start with the more uh, lower priced options and then look all the way up to kind of the flagship. So I've selected three specific motherboards. We're going to look at the X670 PG or X670 E PG Lightning. And then we're going to look at the Steel Legend and then finally the Tai Chi. So these are kind of three that I sort of think depending on what your budget is, if you're looking at building a new PC or, or for the first time, or if this is like a new upgrade to AM5, and maybe you're on an older Zen-based AM4 motherboard, or maybe even something older, like an Intel uh, core from, you know, the days of Haswell or Skylake or those sort of things, or Coffee Lake even. Uh, let's kind of get into it. So th this first one here, the X670 EPG Lightning. So what I like to do is I typically go to the product page, I sort of skim what they've got here, um, but then what I really want to do is I want to look at the manual because the manual will show you how things are wired and that's kind of what determines the price point as well as the functionality and the different features that you get with each motherboard. So this one I think is a really decent option for those that are on a budget that don't want to spend too much. So the retail price right now as, as of the time of filming, if you're near a micro center, it is $259.99 and I know currently there is a... Uh, sale price for the holiday season for the new Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. So I feel like this motherboard would be really good to pair up with like a Ryzen 5 or Ryzen 7, like a 7600X or a 7700X. I mean, you could even pair this up with a 7900X or even the flagship 7950 and be fine. Uh, they don't, they do draw more power stock compared to the previous generation, but the VRMs on this uh, are sufficient enough you know, 14 plus two plus one VRM design. So it's an eight layer PCB. Uh, pretty much all of these X670E motherboards are gonna be at least eight layer, uh, which is which used to be reserved for very high end uh, motherboards. And that's kind of because PCIe 5 sort of requires the additional layers. So because of all these motherboards, these X670E motherboards support 24 lanes of gen five, you do get the the server grade type uh, PCB here. So there are potentially more layers that could be put on these, but I think they're trying to keep a, a happy medium of cost uh, for these products because this isn't really an enterprise product. So they don't really wanna go above eight layers if possible. So I think that's kind of the happy medium that they, they kind of settled on. So, and you'll see that with the other vendors as well. So I, I guess real quick I should mention that Newegg, the price is the same uh, as the Micro Center pricing, um, although it is kind of back ordered right now. 
um, because I think a lot of these sold during the Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. So if we look at the block diagram though, so you'll find that in ASRock's manual. So one of the really nice things about ASRock is that unlike some other brands, which don't really, they're not really consistent with publishing their block diagrams, ASRock does a really nice job of, regardless of what the price point is. So in this case, we're looking at, you know, like a $260 motherboard. Um, they do provide the block diagram in the manual. Some, what I've noticed is some vendors will not provide this unless it's like a higher end board. Um, but ASRock does a good job, even more of like the budget constrained boards have these. So this is kind of the real value here in terms of the, the, uh, the user manual. So you do see here how everything is kind of wired up. So this, this shows that the X670E chipset consists of both a primary chipset and a secondary one. Uh, I've covered this before in multiple videos. So if you want to see more in-depth coverage on chipset differences and how they work, feel free to check the video above because that's going to be more of like a deep dive session on the differences of the new AM5 chipsets. Um, but if we look at the CPU, the CPU is unique in that you do have USB ports that can connect directly to the CPU, bypassing the chipset. So those are probably going to be really, really good latency wise. Uh, you also have your HDMI, your display port that are on the back. So those are display outs from the, the integrated CPU. As we said earlier, you have your DDR5 dual channel. So you have two DIMMs per channel. So this is a four DIMM motherboard. Just by looking at this, I can, I can derive that. And then on the right hand side here, we have the 16X PCI Gen 5 graphics card slot or PCIe slot, but this is typically where the graphics card is going to go. And then you have a an X4 PCIe slot. They label it as the third PCIe slot. So this is a by four electrically, um, but it is running at Gen 4 as opposed to Gen 5. It is worth noting that this, this slot could technically run at Gen 5, um, but they're running it only at Gen 4. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're trying to keep the budget down on the cost to build this motherboard so they don't have to buy or pay for additional redrivers. Like they don't have the redriver chips um, on the motherboard to basically keep the PCI Gen 5 signaling because this, this slot, if we look at the product page, this is PCI number three. So this is going to be this one here, this X16 physically, but it's X4 electrically. So notice how it's much further from the CPU, which means that it's going to need a redriver. So if they wanted to do Gen 5, they would need more expensive components, traces within this motherboard to provide the regenerative signals uh, for that Gen 5 signal. So that's kind of where they've kind of uh, kept the cost down, but driving this at Gen 4 as opposed to Gen 5. But the primary one is Gen 5, the second one, the second like X4 slot is Gen 4. And it is worth noting that this is still really, really good. Like Gen 4, you could plug in, uh, you know, an M dot, an NVMe uh, M.2 Gen 4 PCIe add-in card. You could plug in a Thunderbolt add-in card would be really good for this. Uh, a 4K60 capture card, like an Elgato uh, 4K or a Live Gamer HD 4K or, or Live Gamer 4K or Live Gamer Bull off of a Thunderbolt add-in card. I've covered this in a different video. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the good use case for that slot. You could also put in a second graphics card if you wanted to do uh, AMD Crossfire, but there's not a, whole, not a whole lot of people that do that, but it is interesting. It is worth mentioning because both of those, both this top slot and the second one, both go to the CPU. So technically Crossfire would work, although you're really only getting like X4 of the total bandwidth on that second card. So it's probably definitely not worth it, but it is worth mentioning. Uh, and then you do get a M.2 slot that is Gen 5 wired. And then the flash ROM for the BIOS. So, and then the secure chips. So basically those are the things that wire to the CPU. If you look at the chipset, you get one uh, Gen 4 M.2 drive. So this takes up all four of the freely available PCIe 4.0 lanes on the primary chipset. The remaining eight will be on the secondary chipset. So a lot of questions come about why, why the secondary chipset has eight PCIe 4 lanes available for 
uh, different things and the primary one only has four available? Well, the answer is because four, the, it does have eight, but four of them are being used for the downlink to the secondary chipset. A lot of people forget that. Uh, you have your uplink four to the processor, but you have four, you have to connect, you have to daisy chain to the secondary chipset, so that's gonna take four lanes. So this is the reason why you only have four available Gen 4 lanes on the primary chipset because four of them are, are wired to the secondary chipset. So you do also have four PCI Gen 3 uh, lanes available, uh, but those are also what they use for SATA. So in this case, they've taken all four of those Gen 3 lanes and they've wired them each to a SATA port. So that gives you four SATA drives. So if we look on the motherboard, sure enough, we can see one, two, three, and four. So those are the four SATA ports. Uh, and then the M.2, the top one here, that was to the CPU. And then this one, one of these two here, uh, or one of these three here rather, are going to that primary chipset. So it's gonna be whichever one is Gen 4. Uh, and then if we look down here, oh, of course you also do have the front panel, USB, two by two, so you have a 20 gig USB, and then you have a bunch of other USB, and then there's a rear, the four USBs on the back, those black ones, are gonna be up for the primary chipset. The rest of these USB ports on the primary chipset are all going to be the front panel. So the secondary chipset, you can kind of see, it's very similar setup for the USB. Yeah, all, almost all the rear USB ports that you see on the back of the motherboard are all gonna be off of the secondary chipset. That 20 gig USB is also on the back. Uh, and then we have the, uh, for the express lanes, so the Gen 4, you have one of them going to an M NVMe drive, and then you have another one going, you have one of them going to a PCIe X1 slot, and another one going to an X1 slot. So these two, that's two lanes of Gen 4, each to one of these, so that means that this X1 slot is Gen 4, and this bottom slot here, which is also, it's physically an X16, but electrically it's only an X1. So it's kind of strange that they do it that way, but that's fine. Um, just know that it's only X1 of Gen 4. So kind of limited in what you can put there. Uh, really the only thing I can think of is like a, a 1080p capture card. 1080p60 would work like a Live Gamer 2. That would work in there just fine. Uh, M.2 underscore 3. So you get one... NVMe drive that is at half the bandwidth. So that's kind of rare to see. Uh, it's an interesting choice. You used to see this in laptops. You used to see this type of thing done in, in laptops when they first started rolling out M.2 in laptops. Uh, but this is kind of weird, a weird choice. So that means that they've got all of the Gen 3 ports are going to the SATA or, or well, they're going to a, a PCIe slot an M.2 slot that can support either Gen 3, X4, SSDs, or a SATA M.2 drive. So that's interesting to see. You don't see a lot of this. This is very rare on uh, X670E, I will say that. This is also extremely rare. Uh, and then you have those X1s. So it looks like the way, they, the way they're allocating the Gen 4 on this chipset is a little strange. So they've got one lane, two, three, Four. So they're only using six out of their eight lanes. So they could have made this a X4 and it would have worked. Um, that must be, so that's M.2 underscore three. So that is this one in the middle. So that's a strange choice. I'm not sure why they went with it that way. Unless I'm doing the math wrong, but this is only one, two, of Gen 4, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's only six, but there's eight lanes available. So there are two lanes that are not actually being used by this motherboard, which is kind of strange. If they wanted to get 100% utilization out of this, they would have made this an X4. So um, I don't think they're using anything for PCIe on this side. So that's a really strange choice by ASRock uh, for that last NVMe drive. So just know that that one only runs at X2. So meaning if you buy this motherboard and you put a Gen 4 NVMe drive in here, in this slot, don't be surprised if you run like a crystal disk mark 
benchmark and the, it's only uh, you know it's much slower than expected and that's because it's like this so that's why it's always good to look at the motherboard manual and that's why I really really like these block diagrams especially because x670e is a daisy chained chipset it's got two chipsets together like this so it's really interesting to see how the motherboard manufacturer decided to to divide up the resources like what some of them they'd like to put the networking in the primary one uh, others will put it in the secondary one and they'll use the gen 4 lanes for an nvme drive like this so that's going to be the pg lightning um, it's it's still a decent motherboard if you don't really care about the wi-fi i mean you can add the wi-fi if you want i don't really think a lot of people are going to do that um, but it is uh, a decent motherboard overall uh, just know the limit there with that NVMe drive. That's like the only thing that I'll ding this motherboard on if I had to grade it on something. I'm okay with the the Gen 4 to the CPU, even though that could have been Gen 5, but that does, I understand that they are keeping the price point down um, so that it's it's more, you know, budget friendly without having to use those redrivers. So that makes sense to me, but this kind of doesn't make sense. That's kind of a, a head scratcher there because they do have two lanes that they aren't actually using. So that is worth pointing out. So now we're going to look at the Steel Legend. So the Steel Legend uh, is a step up from the PG Lightning. And now if I was actually going to build, say, like an, uh, an all-rounder gaming PC, and I was going to go with an ASRock motherboard, this is probably the one that I would go with. This one's definitely worth looking into. It does feature this interesting uh, graphics slot like holder. It like supports the graphics card from sagging so that's nice to see so it's a nice value add uh, and and it also includes the wi-fi so this is kind of like the best all-rounder motherboard from asrock um, and if you guys saw like level one text video on this motherboard so this motherboard can support ecc memory like real full ddr5 ecc memory so that's uh, really nice to see and you can see that's what it looks like when the uh, the support bracket for the GPU is installed. So that's an interesting uh, value add there, I would say. So the only thing about this motherboard, just like the other one that we looked at, the thing that's lacking here is there's no postcode debug LED. When I really don't like it when uh, those are lacking on the motherboard. So that's, that's unfortunate that that's lacking. Now it does have a set of LEDs that will illuminate next to either VGA or RAM or CPU so it does kind of tell you what's going on but it's not really granular it doesn't really tell you like what what the debug code what stage it's at in memory training or what it what it, or is it memory training for example those sort of things are kind of what I'd like to see but this is a $300 motherboard if we check Newegg's pricing so 299 and then Micro Center also 299 so it, it's it is kind of the upper I don't want to say it's like the maximum price because obviously the next one that we're going to look at is even more expensive. But this one is kind of a happy medium of it does everything. It has everything that you need except it doesn't have the postcode. That's like the one thing that is a deal breaker for, for someone like me. Um, it's kind of annoying to not have that on a $300 motherboard. Um, but this is still, if you think about this compared to like last generation, like X570, this is still cheaper than most of the highest end X, uh, X570 motherboards. So like, for example, the Asus Crosshair 8 Hero X570, that was similar to this motherboard, but it was more expensive. It was like $375 uh, at release. And that motherboard did have the postcode though. Um, but, you know, this one does have all the Gen 5 storage. So if we Go back here to the product page. You can kind of see on the back, you have a bunch of USB-A. You have that 20 gig USB-C through the chipset. You have the BIOS flashback button. You have the Wi-Fi 6E. You have the optical audio now, um, but you do not have the line in. So it is kind of weird how a lot of uh, motherboard, I, I feel like there's a weird trend now, not offering the full 5.1 uh, audio, surround audio on here. But I guess, I guess probably what they've done is they've looked at like who actually, how many people use those features. And, uh, you know, with telemetry now, they can kind of figure out, you know, like not that many people are using it. So that's probably why they're doing that as a cost saving measure. Although on a $300 motherboard, it is kind of, uh, kind of frowned upon to see that. If we look at the manual now and we go down to the block diagram, 
So one thing to note that's interesting about this motherboard, it does feature a five pin Thunderbolt header. So you can add USB four via ASRock's Thunderbolt card. So I'll just briefly mention that. So there's a Thunderbolt four add-in card from ASRock, which gives you the ability to do DisplayPort inputs to your Thunderbolt card. And then you have the Thunderbolt four ports out. So those are the 40 gig ports. Um, this, this card is integrated into the next motherboard that we're going to look at. So the Tai Chi does actually have this included in the motherboard. So if you're trying to determine, if you want Thunderbolt 4 on this new AM5 motherboard, um, this one does both the Steel Legend and the PG Lightning that we just looked at previously. Both of them have full support for the Thunderbolt add-in card. Uh, and then you just have to download like the driver for the Thunderbolt card. But that's basically how you get USB 4 on these lower priced motherboards. So both the PG Lightning, you can kind of see the Thunderbolt adder is down here. Uh, but that's nice to see that a sub $300 motherboard can add Thunderbolt if needed. And that would go in that middle X16 physical slot there. So that third one there, that's the X4. Like I said earlier, this is where you plug the Thunderbolt in. And then on the Steel Legend, again, it does have the Thunderbolt as well. So it's like right at $300, but you can add USB 4 ports to it. So that's really nice to see. Uh, if we look at the, just to show what it looks like. So it's gonna be this number 28. It's this one here. Uh, and that would go in, if we go look at the block diagram, that's going to go in the X4 slot right here. So that's where you plug that Thunderbolt card in if you wanted to add that. Because it does need, it needs four lanes of Gen 3. That is the requirement for the Thunderbolt 4 add-in card, for those wondering. So it's nice that we're starting to see a lot more USB 4, Thunderbolt 4, Thunderbolt 3 support on AMD platforms. So just like with the other motherboard, you have your HDMI and your DisplayPort, the flash, the BIOS security the integrated audio is plugged in to the cpu so this is plugged into the single usb 2 port internally uh, for the 2 plus 1 audio again you know four dims of ram uh, for dual channel and then you have the x16 gen 5 you have the primary m.2 slot which is gen 5 capable uh, and then you have the four remaining free lanes just like with the PG Lightning, they're not using the read drivers. Um, but this one, unlike that one, this one is uh, Gen 3, whereas on the cheaper motherboard, you had Gen 4. So people might ask, well, why is that? Well, the thing is, the reason why the cheaper motherboard actually has more higher spec bandwidth, so Gen 4 as opposed to Gen 3, is because of the distance. So if you look here, this slot is, you know, about this far. If you guys see the mouse, it's about this far from the CPU. So that again, I guess they determined that's good enough for PCI Gen 4. But if we go look at the, the Steel Legend, this bottom slot is the X4 Gen 3 slot. This additional distance from the CPU, uh, I guess the signal integrity can only do Gen 3 reliably. Now it can probably do Gen 4, but it, it they probably found that there's probably some, there's too much noise, too much electrical noise, and they don't want the read drivers for the Gen 4 down there. So that's kind of how, or there maybe have been some other limitation because there's probably like packed with a, a bunch of other components down there already. So they didn't have any room for the, the uh, read driver for Gen 4 or however they wanted to do it, or maybe there was some kind of limitation. Whatever the reason, this is Gen 3. So just know that, that the Steel Legend, the buy four slot is actually worse than the one on the cheaper pg lightning so if, if that matters to you then you might want to go with the pg lightning uh that being said i would still go with the steel legend over the pg lightning because this motherboard it does include the wi-fi 6e it also includes that support bracket for the gpu which i think is a nice value add so I, overall this motherboard is definitely probably the sweet spot in terms of it kind of gives you everything that you need uh, you can add Thunderbolt to it if you wanted, you know, so all the options are there. It's like the, the Thunderbolt header, the the buy four lane for a capture card or a Thunderbolt card or whatever. 
uh, or even a second GPU, because again, this does go to the CPU. It's not going through the chipset, so that's really nice. So, you know, and you get native on the rear of the motherboard, you get native USB uh, ports, three of them off of the CPU. So that's, that's really interesting too. So then the primary chipset here, we'll just run through it real quick. So a bunch of rear USB ports are on the primary chipset, whereas on the PG Lightning, if we look here, on the PG Lightning, almost all the ports on the primary chipset, all the USB ports, were on the front. So the front panel ones, which are the ones that you typically don't use every day, those are typically the ones that you plug some peripheral in temporarily, like a USB drive or something. Those are typically what I plug into the front. I plug in everything to the back of the motherboard. If I'm gonna leave, set it and forget it. Um, so the because these have to traverse your case wiring so that's why the front panel ones are probably the lesser ones so it is interesting that on the pg lightning they put the front ones on the primary chipset as opposed to on the back so i do like that the steel legend put the rear ones on the primary chipset and the front panel ones most of them are on the back or on the second chipset so that's a really uh interesting choice i'm not sure why they decided to do it differently for these two motherboards uh, but that is worth noting so then when we look at the PCIe lanes, so all four of the Gen 4 lanes on the primary chips that go to an M.2 slot, so that's pretty standard. That's almost the most common thing you'll see. And then for the Gen 3 slots, there are four of them. Instead of wiring them to SATA, they've, they put the networking on the Gen 3 on the primary chips. So you have your 1 gig LAN, the Realtek LAN is taking one LAN of Gen 3, the 2.5 is taking another LAN of Gen 3, then you have an open X1 PCIe 2 Gen 3. So that one would be this one here. The small by one is the that one right there off of the primary chipset. And then you have a Wi-Fi 6E Wi-Fi module off of the last lane of Gen 3. So on the secondary chipset then, that's where your other two Gen 4 drives are gonna go. So that's all eight lanes of the Gen 4 bandwidth available. And then they took all four of the uh, the PCIe 3 lanes and wired those up to SATA, so you get four SATA ports. So overall, I really like the way that they have allocated all the resources on the Steel Legend. They left no stone unturned. Basically, every single lane is wired to something. Nothing is just dangling disconnected. Whereas on the Lightning, they wasted two lanes down here. This could have been an X4, uh, of Gen 4 bandwidth because remember I said the total is 8 and if you count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 well there's 2 more because there's 8 total so this one's this is kind of wasted uh, resources here on the PG Lightning and I also don't like that the rear ports are on the secondary chipset as opposed to the primary chipset the way they did on the Steel Legend is better um, so overall this motherboard is the one I would go with if I was a uh, on a budget and I wanted to build like a gaming PC that could also do a lot of other things like content creation. So it gives you a lot of options. You can add Thunderbolt, etc. So now we're going to look at the final motherboard. So this is going to be the flagship motherboard. Now there is the Tai Chi Carrera, which has like a marble white finish, but that's like $30 above the price of the, the regular Tai Chi. So this one, uh, and I kind of think this one at $500 kind of is the top of the line. So this is $499 off a of new egg. Same price at Micro Center, but you do get the $20 off when you bundle it with the CPU. Um, but this one is going to be the one that has, like, they say has it all, right? Like, it's the flagship. So, this one includes this Thunderbolt 4 adding card. So, if you wanted to add Thunderbolt 4 to an AM5 motherboard, you would go with the Steel Legend and you'd buy, <coughs> you'd buy this card separately at a later date and add that. So, that is nice for people that are kind of... They don't really know if they are going to ever use Thunderbolt or they don't really need the USB-C. Um, but for those that want it, uh, depending on the price of this add-in card, if you go check out the price, like I think this price, this, this card is kind of hard to find, but if you can find one in your area, uh, I do think that the Steel Legend plus this is a good choice. Um, but if you want Thunderbolt day one and you don't want this taking up a space in the case, then the Tai Chi, you know, depending on the price point, the Tai Chi might be more cost effective because the Tai Chi already includes that Intel Thunderbolt controller like natively on the motherboard. 
so it's soldered on the board so that is worth noting we'll, we'll point out right now what that is so you guys look right here these two USB-C ports on the ASRock X670 Taichi have that Thunderbolt logo, so that lightning bolt with an arrow there. That it, those are your two 40 gig ports that typically would be what you have on that add-in card. Now, what you lose going with the Taichi as opposed to going with the separate add-in card, you lose the DisplayPort inputs. So these these are there, uh, but if you're going with the Taichi, you don't have that. Now with the Taichi though. So again, the manual from ASRock is very good. Documentation is always really good. But you'll notice that there is no Thunderbolt header on this motherboard, and that's because they already have the Intel controller soldered onto the motherboard. So, and yes, here we go. And this is why the block diagram is an invaluable resource if you're really looking to build like a prosumer type desktop. If we look here, notice that you have the HDMI port on the Tai Chi motherboard has display zero. So this is the first display wired to the integrated graphics on the AM5 processor. But if you go down here, notice that they have Intel USB 4 controller Maple Ridge. This is that Thunderbolt add-in card, Intel JHL 8540 Thunderbolt controller. So it's gonna be Thunderbolt 4, USB 4. It's, you know, people might debate whether or not that's an equivalent um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that Thunderbolt 4 and USB 4 are basically the same thing for all intents and purposes. Now, obviously, some features are optional or whatever, and that's where USB is kind of a mess right now. But looking at this, this has that Maple Ridge controller integrated into the Tai Chi motherboard. And look here, Display DisplayPort 1, DisplayPort 2, and this is DisplayPort 0. So it has three video outs from the integrated graphics card, which means... The Tai Chi, the reason why the Tai Chi doesn't allow you to use the display in that you would get on the standalone card is because they've already wired those two ports to the integrated graphics. So that means you can drive three monitors um, off of the integrated graphics. Two of them will be USB C uh, ports off the back of the motherboard, and then one of them will be an HDMI. But that's really, really interesting how they've done that. Um, and then you can either do display outs or you still have the Thunderbolt ports and then the USB Type-C form factor. So it says USB 4. So that's really nice to see. Um, that is, they are actually wiring that up via that PCI Gen 5 X4 slot, and then they have a PCI 5 a Gen 4 slot for an M.2, so it's the primary drive. Uh, and then what they also do is they give you two physical X16 slots. The top one will be the Gen 5 X16. The second one will be a by 8 So if you populate that second slot, uh, your primary graphics card will drive at X8 speed or run at X8. So that is going to be those two uh, slots there. So unfortunately, there are no additional PCIe slots. So meaning if you wanted to add, you know, like a Aver Media capture card or something or an Elgato internal capture card, you have to plug it into the by 8 and that is going to run your GPU at X8. So what I would say to people who want to avoid doing that you would want to buy an external 4K capture card, something like an AverMedia Live Gamer Bolt, which I do have a video on the channel showing that in a couple of videos now uh, for the AMD platform. But you would basically plug the 4K60 Live Gamer Bolt into one of those USB-C Thunderbolt ports on the back. And that is how you would get the 4K60 uh, video from like a PS5 or something. So that's how that would work. Uh, and then moving on, so you also do have some rear USB ports that go straight to the CPU. You have, uh, this might be dual BIOS, I'm not sure. Um, and then you have, you know, obviously what we just talked about. So with the chipset then, the primary chipset, all four of the lanes go to an NVMe slot. Um, but what they've done here is a little bit interesting. They, they allow you to do SATA. So which means that they have some kind of, uh, well, they've wired a switch here so that if you're, you're doing, uh, they have an Asmedia 1061 that drives two SATA drives or SATA ports. So the A3A1 and the A3A2, uh, I'm not sure what this means. So if you're doing, oh, I guess, oh, I think I understand. So, so 
the AES Media controller can allow you to drive a SATA M.2 drive up here in this slot. But if you do that, it will disable the A3A1. That's kind of what the way I'm understanding this, this uh, diagram here. So then you also have another AES Media for two more. So you cannot do RAID with these four SATA ports because they're using these AES Media chipsets. So essentially split the bandwidth off of a single PCI 3 lane so that you can do two drives per lane. Because typically one lane of Gen 3 equates to one SATA port on these motherboards. So what they've done is they've actually used as media chips to split it so that you get uh, two. So so I, this is where I would plug in like an optical drive, like a DVD burner or a, a, you know, a Blu-ray drive or whatever. Or, or an old spindle hard disk drive. I would not plug in like SATA SSDs in here, like the 2.5 inch SATAs. Now you could, now they won't be that fast. Um, I would probably plug in like a two and a half inch SATA down here on the secondary chipset to any of these. And these four down here support RAID. So it's very interesting what uh, ASRock has done with the Tai Chi. This, is, this allows them to get the full eight SATA ports um, on the motherboard, which is very, very rare to see on these newer motherboards. I think SATA is slowly phasing out over time, um, but it is interesting because this does have eight SATA ports on the motherboard, and they're doing they're achieving that using these as media splitters, these uh, splitters for the PCIe. Then you have the Wi-Fi 6E taking one Gen 3 lane, and then you have the Intel uh, one gig. This is a, a, a one gig port or Ethernet port. Uh, right there on that final Gen 3 lane. So so they've done all the networking. They managed to do the networking and they gave you like four SATA ports potentially off of uh, all three of the, all four of those Gen 3 lanes. So that's really interesting that that's a good use of the resources there. Um, it's, interestingly enough, they did wire the audio to the chipset to a single USB 2 port off the chipset as opposed to the CPU, which is what they did in the other motherboards. Um, but they do have an ESS DAC on this one as well. So and then on the secondary chipset, it's it's kind of interesting. Some of the rear, some of the rear USB is on the primary, some of it's on the secondary, and then on the and then front. It's kind of split evenly between the primary and the secondary. Uh, and then on the secondary one, you do have two additional M.2 drives and then four SATA drives. So overall, this is a very nice motherboard. Just overall, it includes the USB 4 built in. And it is the Intel controller, so that typically means that you should have very good compatibility with various different Thunderbolt devices with this motherboard. So uh, that's really nice to see. Um, it is a $500 motherboard though, so this is kind of the flagship board from ASRock if you are looking at getting uh, X670E. But with that, we're going to go ahead and end the video. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you guys think of these ASRock X670E motherboards. If you were going to go with AM5, which one of these three would you go with? If you're going with ASRock, or if you're looking for small form factor, let me know in the comments below. And I will catch you guys in the next video. Thanks.